In this video, we're going to be talking about two common special tests for diagnosing tears in the infraspinatus and teres minor muscles. But before we get into that, let's briefly review these two muscles. On the left here in green, we see the infraspinatus. This muscle originates in the infraspinous fossa of the scapula. And then this convergent muscle narrows down to a tendon, which inserts on the greater tubercle of the humerus, specifically the middle facet. This muscle is innervated by the suprascapular nerve, which also innervates the supraspinatus that sits atop the scapula. The action of infraspinatus is glenohumeral external rotation, sometimes called shoulder external rotation. Common mechanisms of injury for the infraspinatus include overuse injuries, particularly with repetitive overhead movements, age-related degeneration, and falling onto an outstretched hand, also called Fouche injuries. This is the teres minor muscle, obviously in green. This muscle originates off of the lateral border of the scapula and also inserts onto the greater tubercle of the humerus, but this time it's the inferior facet of the greater tubercle. Like the deltoid muscle, this is innervated by the axillary nerve, and it also performs glenohumeral external rotation like the infraspinatus. Like the infraspinatus, common mechanisms of injury include overuse, particularly with repetitive overhead movements, aging, and Fouche injuries. The teres minor is also particularly susceptible to fatty infiltrates, which lead to degeneration of the muscle and tendon. And even though the teres minor can be damaged due to repetitive overhead movements and age-related degeneration, these mechanisms are much more common for the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus, which we will cover in a separate video. The two special tests that we're going to talk about now are hornblower sign and the resisted infraspinatus test. Understand that both of these tests will be positive when there's an infraspinatus tear or a teres minor tear. However, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter which muscle is torn, it's not going to affect the plan of care for the patient. The rehab is going to look pretty much exactly the same, regardless of which muscle is torn. Let's now look at Hornblower's test, also called Hornblower's sign. This is a special test that's used to assess for either a tear in the infraspinatus muscle or a fatty degeneration of the teres minor muscle. The psychometrics of this test are pretty amazing. The sensitivity is all the way up at 100%, and the specificity isn't that far behind at 93%. So this test is good for both ruling out a tear of the teres minor muscle and ruling it in. If somebody tests positive for hornblower sign, they have a 93% chance of having a teres minor tear or some kind of fatty degeneration of the tendon. Also, if they test negative for hornblower sign, then pretty much you can say with 100% certainty that they do not have a pathology of the teres minor muscle. So how do we conduct this test? Well, it can be done in either standing or a seated position like you see right here. Basically, the PT is going to passively flex the patient's shoulder up to about 90 degrees in the scapular plane with the elbow bent to 90 degrees, and the shoulder joint overall is going to be in slight internal rotation, just short of neutral in that position. And while holding that position, the PT, as in me, is going to apply a force into internal rotation and the patient's going to resist by attempting to externally rotate their shoulder. It's basically a variation of the external rotation manual muscle test. It just occurs in a slightly different position. So let's take a look at that right here. So you'll see I passively flex his shoulder up to 90 degrees in the scapular plane, and then the elbow's bent to 90 degrees, and that's where I apply that internal rotation force, and he resists by activating his shoulder external rotators. So what constitutes a positive test? Well, it's gonna be reproduction of the patient's familiar shoulder pain. And you will also see weakness compared to the unaffected side. Now, the position for Hornblower's test right here gives us about maximum activation of the teres minor muscle, which is why it's good for assessing a tear or degeneration of the teres minor. However, you are not gonna be able to eliminate infraspinatus contributions because both muscles are external rotators. So this test will also be positive if somebody has an infraspinatus tear. So understand that. 
But the good thing about having a Terry's minor tear versus an Ephraim's tear is it doesn't actually change how you approach the rehabilitation. Doesn't matter which muscle is torn or damaged, you approach it in the exact same way. So the fact that this test would also provoke a torn infraspinatus does not matter for our purposes. We're now going to talk about the resisted infraspinatus test, also called the resisted external rotation test. In reality, this is just an external rotation manual muscle test for the shoulder. And notice it's a part of two test item clusters, one for subacromial impingement syndrome and another for full thickness rotator cuff tear. If we look at the psychometrics, the specificity isn't great, it's 0.74, but the sensitivity as a standalone test is 0.90 or 90%. Given this higher sensitivity, this means that we can use this test as a screening tool to rule out one of these two shoulder pathologies. So if we do a resisted infraspinatus test and the result is negative, that means that there's a 90% chance that they do not have these two conditions, subacromial impingement syndrome or a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Now the way you perform this test is identical to how you do the manual muscle test because it is a manual muscle test. You can have the patient in standing or seated. I'd prefer to have them in seated like you see right here. The patient's gonna begin with their shoulder in neutral, meaning arm and elbow by the side. The elbow is gonna be bent to 90 degrees like this and their thumb is going to be face up. And what I'm going to do as the practitioner is I'm going to apply a force on their forearm, trying to push their forearm inwards, and they're going to resist by trying to attempt to move the shoulder into external rotation. So here I am applying that inward force, and he's going to resist that by using his shoulder external rotators. A positive test here is going to be reproduction of the patient's familiar shoulder pain, and we'll probably also see weakness on that side compared to the unaffected side. Now, obviously, this would be a negative test because, one, there was no weakness, and also there was no pain reported with this force. One more thing. When you're doing this test, make sure that the patient's arm and elbow stays against their side. Sometimes if there's weakness or extreme pain, they may compensate by allowing their forearm to come in, but then their arm flares out. 